There are more and more trucks on the road, and there are so many more accidents. If you or your loved ones have been injured in a truck accident, you need to call me. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com. Bernstein Show. Now, here's Ed. Hi, welcome to our show. Um, hey, have you ever wonder, like, if I take that melatonin, does it really work? What type of vitamins, what type of supplements should I be taking? Are they effective? Boy, it's so confusing. With me today to help iron out some of the confusion, uh, Paylene uh, Thorogood and Jeffrey Chen, welcome. Now, you, you two have gotten together to um, kind of take, there's a gap, in my opinion, there's a gap of information. Like when I go to Walgreens or I'm going to, to buy some vitamins or supplements, you know, everybody's touting they're the best or this combination works, only to find six years later that what I thought was good for my heart doesn't really work, right? And the two of you have noticed that this is a problem for consumers. And then you got together and tell me what you did. Well, you called it a gap. We call it the same thing. We call it a proof gap. Mm -hmm. There is a proof gap of effectiveness on the true effects of these supplements, these uh, non-prescription products that we all get from Walgreens, from Whole Foods, wherever. There is not enough evidence on them because clinical trials were not designed for these products. They were originally designed to serve pharmaceuticals. Do they even have to have clinical trials? If I want to put out a supplement, do I have to do a clinical study? Unfortunately not. Yeah, no, you, you don't. And that's, there was a series of laws passed in the 1990s mm -hmm. that allowed you to bring dietary supplements to market. And the thinking behind it was these are products that have generally been used uh, in many times for centuries or millennia, and they're generally recognized as safe and can be purchased without prescription. And so, but another factor to realize is most of these products are naturally occurring, so you can't patent them. And so suddenly the business model of the companies in the supplement space, they can't justify spending the types of money on clinical trials that pharma can, just their business model doesn't support it. They're not creating patents and monopolies around mm -hmm. their products. And so with that, the model right now is, you know, you release a product and you know, unfortunately, not, not only is it not required to do trials, they couldn't afford these pharmaceutical type trials even if they wanted to do them. So it's not really their fault that there's a proof gap. It's that trials don't serve the natural product space. Right, and I'm going to talk in a minute about the um, validity of the trials mm -hmm. themselves in a minute. But, but you're, you're a physician, right? Uh, your, your background is medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, Paleen, yours is um, data. My back, back background is data science and technology, correct. Is it data or data, by the way? I think people call it either way, tomato, <laughs> tomato. <laughs> okay, all right. I just want to say the right word. <laughs> okay, so then how did the two of you get together and you formed a company called Radical? And, and why don't you explain how you got together and what the company really does? So, so my background, you know, I trained as a physician and Specifically, I trained as a physician executive, so I was getting my medical degree and my MBA at the same time at UCLA, and I thought I was going to fix the healthcare system by running a large hospital or a large insurance group. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of grad school, I realized just how the problems that needed to be fixed potentially were insurmountable, at least maybe in my lifetime and career. And what was interesting about the entire non-pharmaceutical world, natural products, supplements, all these things, was that you didn't require prescriptions. You didn't need to worry about insurance reimbursement. You didn't need to spend 10 years getting a new product through the FDA like you did for pharma. So it represented a potentially very bountiful way to deliver better health outcomes to people using products that were inherently affordable, couldn't be patented, couldn't be monopolized, and that people could access. But the problem was there was so much data missing for reasons we kind of talked about yeah. earlier. So after medical school, I started running clinical trials at UCLA 
focused on natural products. And it was about five years ago that I came across Paylene. Uh, and at the time, she was funding lots of studies on natural products. But maybe I'll let her explain where that came from. Sure. So um, like we talked about, my background is data, data. My background <laughs> is big data analytics, uh, studied engineering, and moved into the world of data and analytics to really bring a data-driven thinking to business. So it was not really in healthcare. It was in MarTech, sales tech, really bringing data-driven thinking mm -hmm. across industries to change how business is done. And I was doing great. And life was wonderful until my husband almost died from um, um, a major heart issue. Um, the Western medicine was amazing with multiple open heart surgeries, fixing things, but the opioids they gave afterwards were not so great. Um, and so I was looking for alternatives. I'm a Mediterranean girl, born and raised in Turkey, uh, mm -hmm. grew up, you know, taking both uh, pharmaceuticals as well as my grandmother's many potions. So I wanted to look at things and uh, came across CBD at the time. Um, we tried it. Uh, we tried a few other man, um, natural products. They worked great. And then I realized there was no data on their effectiveness. And I started talking to people. Some people said it worked great for them. Others said it did not work at all. And as a data person, I wanted to find out more. So uh, with a dear friend, Annie Norda, I started a nonprofit, a 501c3 called Holistic Research and Education Foundation to fund research uh, into clinical trials to understand how these natural products work. Um, Wonderful effort, working with some of the top universities. That's how I met Jeff at UCLA, working with UCSD, Columbia University, University of Utah. And I love the work we're doing. But one of the areas I noticed, in addition to the expense and the speed issues we talked about, I noticed a lack of diversity in the population and, the, and also the population size we're studying. The studies were 20, 30, 40, 50 people, very homogeneous populations, oftentimes males and uh, really wanted to not only study these faster and cheaper, but really wanted to bring that diversity that I saw was lacking in, the, you know, in clinical trials to make sure the data was meaningful to all of us, the entire population. Yeah, you know, typically, you know, I, I don't know anything about uh, uh, clinical studies, but I assume that, um, right, that when somebody participates in a clinical study, they are required to follow certain guidelines. So if they tell you to take this particular supplement at 9 o'clock in the morning and then, you know, take something else six hours later, you have to, you know, there, there's a protocol, correct? Um, but that's not the way that we all really administer supplements. Not at all. <laughs> right? We miss days, we forget, we, so did I take it, did I not take it, let me take it again, you know. So and how do you account for, for that in your business model? So it's, it's such a good point, Ed. And... It's this notion of what happens in a clinical trial, and then there's the real world. And there's this, another big difference there. And again, it comes as no surprise that oftentimes FDA-approved pharmaceutical drugs have these effects that are shown in the really rigid artificial constraints in the clinical trial. And then when used in the real world, doctors are prescribing it, they're giving it to patients, people are missing doses, they go on vacation for a week, and they find that the effectiveness isn't there, or there's other safety issues that bubble up that weren't caught. And in fact, speaking back to diversity of trials and how they, don't rep they often don't represent the population, a vast majority of drug recalls, pharmaceutical drug recalls, are because of unanticipated side effects in women because they often weren't studied very much in the actual right, clinical yeah. trials. That, that's the diversity issue that basically the well, you I mean, earlier. it's actually yeah. the diversity issue comes in multiple fashion, right? So, for sure, it's uh, we've been studying more men, and also it's racial, white men. And racial, I mean, it's, and it's also, like prostate cancer is different, blacks and whites, right? Yeah. And also uh, urban populations. Yeah. We don't really study rural populations either because they don't have access to these physical clinical trials. Right, and they're probably living with much cleaner air. <laughs> <laughs> different environmental exposures, yeah, lifestyle, sure. yeah. diet, all these things. Yeah. And so in our studies, as much as possible, we try to mimic the real-world setting. So rather than taking people and dragging them into a hospital where I administer the medicine to them, and, uh -huh. you know, also take up a lot of their time. Imagine a single parent, they have no time for this. So then suddenly they're not represented in the clinical trials that are based around the hospital. So we go completely virtual, we're mailing products to people and we let them, you know, we kind of give them instructions on how to take it. But we also realize that you might miss a dose or things pop up. And so we account for all that. In, in not setting such rigid artificial constraints and how you use the product and all these things so that when we have a data set at the end, it's most likely to represent what's going to actually happen in the real world. And you've done this 
I suspect, a hundred or more, or more times. What are you finding? I mean, are you, when you are doing these clinical studies, are you finding that, um, that they're being represented the way they should be, or are you finding, hey, there, there's some issues in the way this is being marketed? Sure. So when it comes to these products, um, we're running placebo-controlled blinded studies. And this is kind of the gold standard of medical research. Right. Um, and it's very different than just giving someone something being like, are you feeling better or not? Uh, there's a lot of biases there. And so, yes, in some of our studies, the products are coming back. They're no better than placebo. And the companies that we work with are now given an opportunity to say, wow, there's, otherwise we would have no idea. And it's because we give the product to our customers, they tell us they love it, and they give us these testimonials. But it gives them an opportunity to improve the products. Other times we're finding that certain doses of the product don't work, mm -hmm. but higher doses do work. So you're talking about what's the identity of the ingredients, what are the dosages, and form factor matters too. Um, things that might come in a gummy versus a liquid tincture will absorb differently. And now you're going back to different levels of effectiveness as well. And we've studied about over 20,000 people in this virtual model since we launched the company yeah, last year. Yeah, I mean, the delivery system of any drug is, is important, whether you're inhaling it, whether you're getting an injection, whether a liquid and a gummy or a, um, um, something you swallow entirely different, whether it goes through your digestive system or, or, or it doesn't. Um, so how do we know? How, how do we as consumers know? I, I, look, I started the show by saying, talking about vitamins. I've taken vitamin D3 for a number of years, you know, my cardiologist for years saying, hey, D3 is good for your heart. Recent clinical studies say, well, we really don't find any benefit to uh, D3 for cancer or heart disease. Um, this seems to happen with basically every vitamin and supplement. You get contradictory information. What's the consumer to do? I mean, there's, we talked about the gap, but you, I mean, you're working to fill it, but it's not really there yet, right? So I'd say one of the areas is that not everything works for everyone the same way. So back to that personalization, right? So um, nobody in America has 1.2 kids and half a dog. So we really have to, you know, we have to go back mm -hmm. to how a product works for you versus me differently. I mean, you and I are not just different because we're male and female. We have a lot of other elements, you know, different genetics, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure uh, by using this diversity model that we are able to understand how different products work for different people so that we don't just have conclusions saying this doesn't work or this works. It works for this population at this dosage. So you want to get to that personalization, and I think that is the power of our work. So you don't just have averages that people get confused by. Uh, because the anecdotes may actually contradict it. You actually know how it works for you, people like you. You know, um, I just got back a report from my DNA with 23 in me. Mm -hmm. I, I did that. And um, so you get back, you know, hey, you may be susceptible to this illness or that um, disorder mm -hmm. or whatever. Is there a, um, a place where you can... You can take your DNA, or, or do you foresee a time in the future where you can take your DNA, combine it with the kind of research and mm -hmm. clinical studies that you're doing, taking these diverse models and coming up with a correlation of that this will work with populations with this type of DNA? And is that really what we're going to have to do one day? Th that's precisely yes. where we're headed as a company, as well as where I think medicine in general is headed to. And right now, the, the main predictive variables we use, when we use them at all, is things like gender, sometimes age, sometimes ethnicity. So relatively crude metrics. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't use them at all. So you know, your doctor prescribes you a med, whether you're male, female, black, white, everyone's getting right. prescribed. If you're 120 pounds or 400 pounds, it's the same medicine sometimes, which, you know, it's not necessarily logical. <laughs> not at all. Right. You would think hey, if somebody's twice as big, they're going to yes. need twice as much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. and, and especially in the dietary supplement natural product right. world, where we have, you, 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 have barely, you have no data to really guide you on that level of personalization. And so, you know, right now, adding that diversity, number one, gives you more variables. And when we say diversity, it's not just demographics. It's lifestyle. It's mm -hmm. diet, all these other elements that come into play. And then, yes, soon we'll be actually starting to have people opt in 
to actually provide their DNA data. And then what we can do is use that as just another predictive variable and over time match it. And DNA is not the end all be all. It's just one extra piece in this puzzle. It's your DNA, it's your lifestyle, it's your diet, all of these elements. So what your company, Radical, is, um, it, is doing is you're kind of a um, intermediary between the manufacturer of a supplement and the consumer. That it, you're trying to create a pathway in between where, um, and I ref like to refer to it as the old school, the good housekeeping seal, mm -hmm. that you can take a, a product and talk about the efficacy of that product, the veracity of that product, and how it affects different diverse populations, and give it a stamp that, yeah, this product will work in this type of gene pool or the mm -hmm. population, or it won't, or it, under these conditions. So the consumer has information because we're lost. We need some help. We don't know what to do. You know, um, it's, and by the way, are you in favor of, uh, do, we, do we need more um, FDA um, validation for these supplements? Or do we need to be going the other way? Where, because even recently with, uh, 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 for diabetes, um, you know, they're saying you don't, may not need a prescription now to get the, you know, the, uh, the drug for insulin, right? Um, so some of these drugs are so commonplace, you know, why, do, why, you know why, why are we creating all this red tape to get prescriptions? On the flip side, shouldn't there be some regulation for some of the supplements that we are taking that may be more powerful and potent than some of the prescriptions? Because in the final analysis, aren't they all just plants? So, so many amazing points you just brought up, Ed. Yes. Yeah. So the first thing is, you know, if you look at all FDA drugs that have ever been approved, about more than half of them were actually first identified and derived from plants before they were extracted. And then the pharma companies would create a synthetic version that was slightly modified so this could be patented. The natural version can't. And then this, they would be willing to invest millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Even if the, even if the natural um, component was more effective. They, they need to synthesize it because they can't yeah. patent the natural right. component. Mm -hmm. um, and you brought up a, a great uh, conundrum in some ways where you want to maintain as much access as possible. So it's kind of nice for, say, the natural product supplement space that you can just bring a product to market very easily. I don't have to go through 10 years of uh, clinical trials like right. pharma does because these are based in plants. There's a lot of safety data. But we've been using them for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And then the flip side is how do you protect consumers? So what I think is potentially... Um, if, if there were to be additional red tape, so to speak, maybe it's more on making sure that when the product says it has XYZ in it, let's make sure it has XYZ in it. Is, is there anybody really checking that now? There's, uh, there's kind of informal ways to check it. It's a lot of um, self-regulation, self-policing. Mm -hmm. And technically, the FDA is supposed to do random inspections and audits. But for the dietary supplement space, um, it's not heavily enforced. How about that? So there is actually regulations in place. Right. The FDA doesn't enforce it as regularly as, mm -hmm. and frequently and widely um, is, is what some critics might say. And there's some consumer watchdog uh, organizations, nonprofits, who actually go do these, you know, secret shopping and, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes reveal certain products that either don't have the amounts of the specific uh, um, ingredients they claim or they may actually have, uh, you know, microbial contamination, you know, lead, et cetera, in them. So there's a lot of that that yeah, happens like as well. Consumer Reports does that sometimes. Consumer Reports right? and many other organizations yeah. do that, especially when a specific, you know, category gets really hot You will, and a lot of companies rush in. Some of them may not be made with the best standards. It's, I mean, purity and potency testing is really important. That's foremost because that applies to all of us. Whereas effectiveness has that personalization element like I talked about, and that's a different level of testing. And what is it with um, the data, the data, uh, and the artificial intelligence mm -hmm. that we've gotten to this point in 2022 that makes what you're doing possible? So I think there's a couple key features here, but as we see the whole world is going virtual, that's a massive shift that we've seen. Mm -hmm. COVID only accelerated that. And we're also seeing a lot of these direct-to-consumer models. Um, and so for us, we like to say that we're doing direct-to-consumer you know, proof and research, uh, proof generation and conducting medical research. Why do I need an expensive hospital? Why do I need expensive doctors and research staff in person? 
why can't I go directly to consumers, ship them product, have them directly provide data back to me, not on pen and paper collected by a researcher, but they can just directly tell me through their mobile devices changes in their sleep using these validated outcome measures. Um, as well as none of this was possible before you had really good infrastructure to um, give people uh, internet connectivity, people didn't have that many mobile devices, smart devices. I um, mean, it's just a fundamentally new way of thinking as well about how do we do this, not just cheaper and faster, but how do we do this better? And that's why we don't just say we're doing better trials. We're really creating this new category of proof as a service to help the entire non-pharmaceutical sector demonstrate that they're real. And some of the information is better today than it used to be. And I'm referring to, I have an Apple Watch. Mm -hmm. Measures my sleep. Mm -hmm. And I keep track of that every mm -hmm. night. You have one also. Yep. Okay. You got the same band, by the way. I love this band. <laughs> I know, know me too. It's great. Yeah. It's like mag <laughs> works on magnets. But the, um, so it would tell me how much REM sleep I got, mm -hmm. how much deep sleep, how much light sleep, when I'm awake, what my heart rate was, what my, uh, what the audio sounds were. I heart mean, rate variability. Y yeah. yeah. I mean, so all that information was not massively available five years ago that it, like it is today. So while you're doing these clinical studies, this is another component to test the veracity of what you're measuring. Well, we can into, so the, how you feel about your sleep, I'd say is probably most important. So when you wake up, like uh, how, how did you feel? And you can actually go through these right. validated indices to be able to answer that. But sometimes what I, what I find funny, I don't know if you do the same thing. Yeah. I look at my watch and I'm like, oh, that was a great night. And I'm like, oh, I got a 60. I probably slept oh, badly. This is, this is the, <laughs> Haleen, you just went into the segue of my next topic, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> It's sometimes what we think and believe is powerful. You call it placebo, right? It's, um, let's talk about that for a moment because you're so correct. I could um, think I got a, a great night's sleep. I look at my watch and it looks, you know, hey, I was asleep for three hours and 59 minutes. Uh, I, what? And now all of a sudden I'm tired, right? <laughs> so true. Yeah, and, but you were telling me earlier, Dr. Jeff, that, uh, that placebo is medicine. Yeah, and this is where <clears throat> I'm, I'm sometimes torn between this because on one hand, the power of the mind is powerful and there have been time and time studies again where if you believe something and for instance, you believe that a treatment can help you, your body will physiologically change uh, and, and it's powerful. And so on one hand, it's, you know, I think that the placebo effect is benefiting lots of people all over the planet who have positive beliefs about whether they, when they pray or meditate, they are healing their body, or when they eat certain foods, they're healing their body, when they take certain supplements, mm -hmm. healing the body. It's a powerful effect. Um, and I would never want to just flip a switch and take away that belief and then take away those physiologic changes. This is the mind-body connection that we are starting to understand more and more as a science. But on the flip side, what I want to be able to do is, okay, great, you're taking this product you have a belief about it that's positive and it's benefiting you. Cool. But is there something even better that you could be taking that isn't just relying on the placebo effect and therefore you're getting an even better effect? So that's really what I want to be able to do. It's, it's not an or thing, it's an and thing. Right. Let's let people have their placebo effect and let's also figure out what's even better uh, and there's what's the, uh, actually effective on top, on beyond that. And how do you protect against the opposite? where people are so much into the mind part of it, hey, I'm gonna positive, believe positive, believe positive, pray, believe, 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 to a point where they are not really um, utilizing the medical side like they should, because belief in and of itself, oftentimes, just by itself, is not a cure. I mean, it could help, I understand that, I get that, but, it's, but, it, but you can't say it's a cure. Um, so there's a danger of coming too far the other way as well. And that's why I think it comes back to let's, what, what is the middle path? And, let, and that's where science can actually speak to mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, you can take, you can have people have some sort of grounding to come back to. Um, and also that, that's the other inherent potential, you know, problem is that if you have such a strong belief in treatment X that you 
avoid other things that could be helping you more, right. especially when those other things don't have a strong science and evidence to convince you to try them. So I think it's, you know, for instance, um, when I was in medical school, you would see sometimes in oncology especially, these cancer patients who would stop uh, all their treatment because they want to, you know, go fully into some, you know, alternative modality. And it was very painful for the oncologist to say, you know, what do I do for this person? Um, and so I think that ultimately it has to come back to like the science and uh, w allow people to have their beliefs, but allow science to modulate and shape those beliefs as well and find that, that and combination of the two. provide the data. So it's all back to the data right. at the end of the day. So our studies are blinded and placebo controlled. So when we send you product, it's, we don't know whether you're getting the actual active product <coughs> or the placebo. You take it. You're, we're collecting your data, you may believe you're getting better and you're actually taking a product, maybe active, maybe placebo. At the end of the trial, we unblind you and we tell you what you took and we also tell you how you fared, how your initial symptoms were, how you know, badly you were sleeping and how this product may or may not have helped you. And you'll be able to see if it improved. And you may have improved under placebo, as Jeff indicated, it's real. Right. But then you get to see how your uh, improvement compared to the people who took the active in that case. So you have data in front of you to see how you compared on average, how you compared to other women, how you compared to other coffee drinkers. And, and, and that is so powerful. And you have transparency. Correct. And, and that is absolutely Let me ask you, we have about a minute left. I just want to ask you very uh, quickly about a couple. And you can just say yes, no, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, zinc, does that work for, uh, for a cold? It, the data that I've seen, zinc definitely has um, antiviral properties, so it, it should be able to okay. help. CBD, help for pain? Um, I think uh, th there are clinical trial data that, again, at certain doses and certain types of pain, there actually is data that CBD mm -hmm. can benefit. Melatonin to work to sleep? Certain types of sleep disorders, mainly circadian shift disorders, if you're jet lagged or if you're a shift worker. But in terms of general insomnia, the data is not as strong. Okay, so as a consumer, I mean, do I reach out to a company like you or do you reach out to the consumers? How does that work when you're doing your clinical study? We have 30 seconds left. Well, I think joining our clinical trials is an amazing way to get f uh, free products shipped to you that have been quality tested. And like Paleen said, we're basically taking through a personalized health journey. So that's one way to be involved in the scientific process. And over mm -hmm. time, we will be displaying more and more of our results and even one day releasing a seal of approval, just not today, right now. Great. Jeff, thank you very much. Paleen, do, you guys are doing great work and thank good luck. Thank you so much. Thank we you for really having us. Cutting your time. edge innovation. I <laughs> love it. <laughs> Woo, thank thank you. you. See you next week. Sorry is not enough. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com.